That's an acronym, and it stands for We Intend to Cause Havoc. Yeah. Looking at you now, my man, I can't see you causing much havoc. You look very distinguished and, and calm and collected, but I'm imagining that you're going to fill us in on some of the stories from the 70s. Yeah. Here, it's your microphone. Yeah. Uh, it, it should be on. Try it out. Yes, I'm ready. All right. Um, but uh, beyond The Witch and the five albums that uh, Jaggery created with them, we're going to talk a little bit about the scene that Witch helped create, which is the Zamrock scene. And it was a term coined back then to describe this movement that was taking place in Zambia after independence. Um, this is a movement for which there is very little documentation, and there's only oral history from people like Jaggery, and there are not many people like Jaggery left. Jaggery is the last man standing from the witch band. And I can tell you, having bought many records from Jaggery and the last remaining uh, Zamrock progenitors, that the majority of the people that created this music are dead. They died in the 80s, many from AIDS. And their stories are lost with them. Their families don't know much about the music they made. They know they created music. But if you talk to Paul Ngozi's son, Paul Ngozi's a very famous Zamrock musician. We'll play some of his music later. He can't even tell you about the early stuff because he was born in the 80s. And this all happened between 1972 and about 1979. So we have an opportunity here with him to delve into this, and we're going to try to play not only music that he created, but also music from his contemporaries so that he can give us a little bit of an insight into you know, who these men were, wh who these bands were, and uh, uh, attempt to kind of like uh, draw a path you know, that has been obscured for a very long time. So with that, I'd like to give a very warm welcome to Emmanuel Jaggery Chanda. Thank you very much. I prefer to call you guys because you are artists. Uh, for him, it's, it's natural. Even fathers are guys in America. Hey, you guys, when are we living? You are talking to your fathers, guys. In Africa, it's not like that. <laughs> uh, the big guys are big uh, are dads. Anyhow, um, it's an, inter an interesting um, thing for me to be here. I know someone called Devo didn't want me to be here. I was left by the plane two days ago, but I forced my way yesterday. I got, uh, the, the visa was denied about three times, and I knew that there was something big waiting for me here. When I got here today, finally, I couldn't find my, uh, my luggage. So it's somewhere in the air. <laughs> I don't know where about. But uh, that aside, it's a lesson to even you guys. When you're focused, do not allow anything to distract you. Music, arts, those are not simple things. Talking from, from my own experience, and especially from Africa. We don't have facilities like you guys do. There are no schools, no formal schools per se, where people go and learn and discover who they are musically. Whether they are vocalists, and which keys are favorable for them, which instruments they should use. They get to a studio like this and they'll tell you, I want that sound because they have heard someone play it. Halfway the song, they say, no, 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 not that sound. The, the, the other one, you understand? They don't know what a cello is. The flute and other things. Because probably, partly they are to blame. They don't take time to learn and improve their abilities. And then partly also, music in my country, maybe worldwide, survives on two things. The population of the country, first of all, you have to start with the home ground and the economic situation of that country. If, for example, if there are 80 million people in your country and they are not starving, you just need one good song and it will help you find money to buy your privacy so that you can create better music with that privacy. But the situation at home is different. You don't have peace, because most of the time you are walking around to look for money. Now, when you find that money, you have to, to debate. I buy a bag of meal meal, that's our staple food, or I go and buy a CD. 
I go and pay someone to teach me at the expense of my family eating. So we have such, such problems. Um, however, talent is there, like in everywhere uh, else in the world. Now, there's another additional thing to today. Our young generation, they are totally dependent on the computer. They want all of them to be solo artists. And they will go in the backyard, sample something, paste somewhere, and they sing over that and say, that's my composition. This machine is welcome. The computer is welcome. It's here to stay. But the computer does not feel the music. And music is about feelings and thoughts, emotions. Now, if you leave that to the machine, you are limiting your own creation, creativity. This is what is happening with the young stars. They, dep they depend on the machine that can't feel for them. Maybe for rhythm, I can, as long as there's power in the house, I'll, I'll set a certain rhythm and go to town, go anywhere I want. I'll find that, that uh, rhythm going at the same tempo. That's the advantage it has over the human beings. The human being will tire at one point and slow down the tempo. Now, having said that, we have situations and uh, um, an opportunity in my country that, we, that is not being utilized. We have music from birth to death. There's plenty of, of music in all, we have nine provinces. Soon there'll be 10 provinces. The new president wants an additional one. And in those nine or 10 provinces, we have about 73 ethnic groups, which we call tribes and, uh, and uh, dialects. Every ethnic group has got its own unique type of music and instruments. But we musicians down there do not utilize that opportunity to sort of research and improve on what we think we know musically. Um, Everybody wants to be Tupac. There, there can never be two packs. There can never be two 50 cents. There's only one of each. And uh, my Bible tells me we are all fearfully and wonderfully made. So everyone is unique in here. Now, if you want to be somebody else, it becomes difficult. We had a lot of influence. I'll be, I'll be jumping here and there as long as the story is going. In my time, very few went to secondary school, that is your high school. But they were talented musicians. That brought a problem of language. And uh, <laughs> maybe I can play a song or two. And they are going to ask, what are you saying? <laughs> because sometimes uh, we killed the nice music by singing wrong words. Sometimes it happens. Now, we had influence. The time I was growing up when we were starting music, we had influence from um, Europe, from America, from South Africa, during the pop music. That was rock, pop, rock, pop, uh, popular music that time of the West. And then we didn't know how to fuse that. Then one of the radio DJs coined the Zam Rock. It's Zambian rock, rock and roll, if you like, Zambian rock. So we called it Zam Rock. Now, here's, a, here's a question for you, though, as, yeah. as we get into you know, yeah. that part of it. Yes. I mean, and I don't mean to gloss over anything he said, because he just said a bunch of profound things that mm. you know, people of privilege, and I, I consider myself a person of privilege, I, I, don't, I don't take seriously. I don't take seriously whether or not I'm going to buy food or I'm going to buy a musical instrument or a record, or at least I haven't in a long time. But even when I did, it was almost a selfish concern. This is a, a human concern. And this is, a, this is why there are no records in Zambia. This is why the master tapes, for the most part, from his scene are gone. Because it's a human concern to eat in a place where you know, rampant inflation led to strikes in the 80s mm -hmm. as people couldn't afford food. Mm -hmm. Imagine you know, being a star, and this man was a star. You know, the Witch Ensemble was a humongous deal there, and they played heavy, heavy music. Yet he, like everybody else, is trying to you know, find their way in a, in a, com in a country that's been you know, devastated. So I don't mean to gloss over any of that. But to talk about uh, Zamrock in particular, mm -hmm. I think we really need to hear some of the music 
I mean, unless everybody here is familiar with The Witch. So can we, can we play a song? Let me just explain how we used the, that to come to Zamrock. Um, either we used local language played on a foreign instrument and then trying to pr probably sound like Rolling Stone, Beatles or something like that, which was not possible and we didn't realize that. So in the end, we created something different. It was good though, but um, <laughs> it was difficult to accept in terms of quality because then we didn't um, have many studios. Even up to now, we don't have uh, international standard uh, studios. We don't have, like I explained, this backyard with a computer and things and things. Anyway, maybe play something. We this is the song introduction from the first Witch Album introduction. I, I told you that he was the band leader. He's also the lead singer. So he's the lead vocalist on this track. He introduces the band. This is the first commercially released record in Zambia, privately pressed by the band and their manager in uh, 300 copies and hand sold by their manager at shows. Uh, this song is called Introduction. Let me say this, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, you noticed the language there I talked about. It's, you have to really pay attention. What is he saying? Manager, because this is what we heard on foreign records. Instead of just saying manager. <laughs> so you want to sound like that foreign artist. Uh, this is, we had no experience. We didn't see, any, my band was the first band to record a commercial album in that country, in 1972 or three. So we had nothing to look to, to say, oh, we should do like that, like that. It's, we just imagined big bands, how they behaved. So now, I've, how many know the, poli uh, the police band? They stole my music, I'm accusing them now. <laughs> Because they did message in the bottle with that code progression. If you remember very well, if I, were, I, I was in Europe that time, I was going to say, ah, ah, ah we share the spoils. This is my idea. <laughs> How would they have heard a record <laughs> of which 300 copies were pressed and distributed mainly in one city at your live shows? Oh. How? How would they have heard it? You were hanging out with Sting back then? No, it's, 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 it's just... Uh, Coinc some coincidence. I'm just kidding, man. <laughs> I know, I know. The, uh, the, there, yeah. there, there's a certain reverence for British rock and roll that you hear in that song, but mm. throughout the first two albums that the Witch Band did, uh, Introduction and the follow-up yeah. album, yeah. In, yeah. The past, in the Past, yes. there's a certain irreverence, too. Yeah, and yes, yes, you, yes. You hinted at that earlier. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but later, we slowly... If, if you notice, eventually it was some progress from Introduction album to In the Past album, there was some improvement of, uh, I'm not trying to boast, but trying to, <laughs> trying to show my friends that actually we needed school in addition to our talent. And um, apparently they, they were coming up and in terms of arrangement, we added a few things than to just pa pa da da, pa pa da da, and it goes on like that. But there were some parts where we, we now changed some things. And we put a bit of, um, let me play something for you guys. This is, um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. So you can see we moved a bit from, from the, uh, the obvious three, four chords to some changes somewhere, trying to bring in some dynamics and uh, even though I did not understand what dynamics meant that time. I came to learn that later when I went to study music at a college somewhere. So with the release of these two albums, you'd given Zambian youth something made by Zambian youth, something that they could buy, a, a product of their own country. They didn't have to rely on imports or you know, the Lusaka radio band or any of these other bands that had broadcasts. Well, right? it wasn't just for the youth. Every Zambian wanted to own something by the local group. So even the older people bought uh, the music, except that 
we didn't have uh, a company printing records in Zambia that time. I had to fly with my manager to Nairobi. Uh, they were printing records there at Supra Studios or something like that. I went there twice, but with limited. Uh, I was bringing the records in my bag, uh, like land, uh, hand luggage or something to take to Zambia. And um, <coughs> my bandsmen, including myself, we were very excited to have 300 quarter in each one's pocket after we sold the first batch. I was able to buy my bed, my fridge, and the suit from there. So it encouraged not only us as, uh, as bandsmen, but also other musicians around. Uh, everybody wanted now to, to compose and uh, have something they would call their own. By the way, there's a trick now we, we, are, we organize. Eventually, I'll come to that, but allow me to just jump a bit to tie up to this. Um, when we changed managers twice, because the second manager didn't want us to sign a contract, he, he misconstrued it to be mistrust. I do things for you guys, and now you want to sign a contract and things, so you don't trust me, I'm taking back my instruments. Then eventually we found a, a serious um, recording company from South Africa called Teal Record Company. They are the ones that, uh, we, had a, we had a difference with the manager. So he took away his, his instruments, and then an idea dropped into me and said, okay, you can keep the instruments, but this is not your music. You only sponsored the recording, so can we have our music back? We fought a bit, but eventually again, he, he gave in. And we shared 60, 40% uh, of the master tapes, which we sold to Zambia Music Parlor. Well, then now mm. you, you just mentioned a very important record company in Zambia, Zambia Music <coughs> Parlor, which was run by the late Edward uh, Kuzayo. Kuzayo, yes. sorry. Uh, and the first two which albums received a repress in 1974, so the, uh, the records that you might have seen reissued, if anybody here has ever seen uh, a reissue of Introduction, their first album, it was based off of the artwork from the second issue of the record, which was uh, received quite a few press runs. I can document four myself, so that means that it must have had you know, quite a success in the country. And it did inspire other, uh, uh, other bands, including yes. a very famous band called Muzio Tunia. Yes. And they recorded and released an album called Wings of Africa shortly after the Witch recorded and released Introduction in the Past. And I wanted to see if we could play a song from that so you could uh, you know, maybe fill us in on what some of your contemporaries were doing then. Yeah, maybe, yeah. So I, I would like to say how Monsieur Tunia came uh, into... Oh, please, uh, please. Yes. Um, there was a, a very serious band in the UK from West Africa called um, Osibisa. When they toured our country, we were the curtain raisers that time. And then uh, I saw something about the way they organized themselves, that actually they were more professional than any of the local Zambians' um, um, bands. <coughs> Their music, for instance, they inspired me in two, in two things. We, being curtain raisers for the band, we were allowed to be backstage with them. And I saw how they, they were into their songs, into their music, even before they got to the stage. From there, when they were changing, they were wearing their stage gear. And of course, they had weed. <laughs> I'm sorry to say, but this is what I saw. <coughs> as, as they got ready, if the song started, if their first song during the performance started with a drama, the drama left the changing room first with a cowbell and he walked to the stage, which was about 200 meters from the changing room. It was in a stadium, like a festival setup. So if the song followed uh, by a bass player, the bass player left others getting ready. He followed. When the drama got to the stage, he started the song right away. Then the bass who can paint could take patakupakumpatanta. Others are coming as the song is introduced. When it's full fledged, then everybody was on stage and it's kicked off. So I learned something from there, which we, which as a band we we used the same tactic in Malawi and it was, it was very well received when we toured Malawi. But but the kind of music was a better fusion than our fusion from Osibisa. 
So that was the next uh, inspiration. I saw that they were very serious with fusing African rhythms, crisscross rhythms. That is the strength of the African music. Ours is not the harmonies. It's you guys who are with harmonies. Four-part harmonies. Ours, if it's, I can teach you a simple harmony and you'll be able to play. To sing simple harmony, but it will be nice. We'll see if we have time. We will learn one Zambian short uh, call and, uh, uh, and response uh, song. So this is what inspired Monsieur Tunya. When they saw Osibi tour Zambia, so them, they wanted to follow that footsteps. The other thing I learned from their leader, Ted Osei, I asked him, I said, but what makes you so, so good? He said they had a diploma in music from London. So I said, wow. So if I have a diploma in music, I can go anywhere in the world. <laughs> I, that's what inspired me to get to college. When I got to college, I was told, this is not for musicians who just perform on stage. This is for music teachers, secondary school music teachers. And one thing led to another. I, I wanted so badly to get into college. So I joined the college. And I, I was part time with the band this time. When I joined the college, there was curfew and blackout in my country because there was liberation struggles around us, Zimbabwe, Angola, Mozambique, South Africa. So a lot of refugees came to our country and it was not easy to perform and it also spelled the downfall for my band. No performances, only disco and during the day. And people in my country can't come to a show during the day. They want where they can drink beer and dance. You wanted to play something. <laughs> yeah, but I'm learning so much. I mean, <laughs> I can't tell you how difficult it's been to you know, even speak to Jaggery over the, the few years that we've known each other. You know, sometimes I call for, for days and, you know, he's in the, in, the, in the bush, as he calls it, mining for gemstones, which is his current profession. Phones off, can't get him, you know, email once every three weeks. Conducting an interview, you know, takes a tremendous amount of work on his behalf, a tremendous amount of work. So there's a limited flow of information for this stuff, which is, you know, why I'm enjoying so much hearing you speak about this in the free form in which it, it comes to you. But yes, I did want to play a, a Musio Tunia sure. song because this is a band that, uh, you know, existed as a peer to the witch, but was inspired by them because this album, Wings of Africa, came out uh, after the release of Introduction and In the Past. And this song... Uh, Mapandolo, is that how you say it? Yeah. Mapandolo? Oh, yes. Could you also play, after, immediately after that, could you play, sorry, could you also play the witch, uh, either Nazingwa, Nazingwa? Sure. You have it, Naz sure. After you play Monsieur Tunya, you can see how Osibisa influenced both Monsieur Tunya and the witch. Let's do this. Let's mm. start off yeah, with yeah. Uh, Monsieur Tunya, Mapandolo. Uh, yeah, sure. Jaggery Chanda okay. vocals. <laughs> You were saying about it's the harmonies uh, and how the harmonies uh, weren't the, of primary importance to you mm, in your mm, country. Mm. And you were talking about the rhythms. And we just mm, heard mm, two mm, songs mm. in which rhythm plays the primary role. Can you explain a little bit more about what you meant? Um, uh, in, in our traditional music, here it's saying I'm stranded. Uh, Nazingwa means I'm stranded. I don't have money for bus. No, my, my shorts are worn out and things like that. So the harmonies, they meant to be sad harmonies. It's melancholy feeling to, to that, even though it sounds danceable. But the, the, the mood is supposed, if you get the words, it's supposed to give you some lonesome, uh, some lonesome feeling. But our, our traditional harmonies are spontaneous. There's no arranged harmony parts and things. If you find people playing uh, drums and singing along, anyone, whether they're from a beer or something, if they like it, they'll just come and join. And it's up to the crowd to choose. You are not singing well, move out, but they would want to sing maybe the loudest. <laughs> but if you analyze, after I went to college, I was able to analyze some harmonies. We usually harmonize in thirds, do me, or sometimes do fa, or sometimes do... Um, the so, rarely octaves. And then again, the fourth is for a certain group of people in the southern province of my country, the Tongas. They only harmonize at cadential points, like they are stopping and then... If they don't know the words, they will just... As long as you hear, it's harmony. But they are simple harmonies, 
and they are not restricting. If you feel you, this part is too high for you, you can sing the part that fits in, as long as it's not off chord. So that is the, the, the kind of harmonies. But the strength, even a small uh, child like this, when they feel that music, they will dance rightly. Because that is the strength of the African music, is that it's dance music. And usually we don't have um, instrumental music on its own where people just listen to instrumental music, except in very rare cases. When probably a xylophone is played while the chief is embarking uh, from the boat or uh, um, getting onto the boat to, maybe you've heard of Kuomboka when the chief, the, the, the chief of the Lozis has two palaces. One, when it's rainy season, he leaves that palace to go to the dry land. So they call that Kuomboka. And then they play music, uh, xylophone, when, to accompany his movements. Uh, the other part is in northwestern part of my country, among the Luales, Kaundes, and things. They play what they call kachacha. One man can play seven drums, a set of drums, seven of them. He's playing rhythm and solo in there by himself. But it's very rare. Our music is usually vocal. There are some voices there. And, and also, we use it a lot for therapeutic um, purposes. When somebody's possessed, they play drums, different rhythms, and the, those uh, demons or whatever they are called, they are evoked. So when they manifest, that's when they are cast out. So music plays there. I'm sure even in the Bible, David was playing for King Saul. So it, music plays a role in healing spiritual problems. So how about those rhythms that we heard in those two songs there? Are there similarities between the two? Are there differences? My, our, our, you heard ours was more on the rock and roll side. Mosotunya was a bit more on tradition um, side. The way they moved, they, they, it wasn't so much of that movement, but it's the movement is actually African. It's different from our type. But they're both Zamrock stuff. Somebody's trying to fuse something into that music. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the lead singer for uh, Muzio Tunya, Derek, Derek, yes. Derek Mbao, mm -hmm. he's not singing in English. You sang your first two albums exclusively in English. Well, that's what we got from our influences from uh, Europe. And uh, English is an official language in my country. So because of, we have about 72 dialects, it's difficult to, to, to influence people. But where we grew up, we were on the Copper Belt. The main language there is Bemba and English. So that we were trying to touch more people by singing in the language that they would understand. What was Derek singing in on that uh, Ma Mapandolo song? What were they singing about? What was, what was the language? The language is from Eastern uh, province, Nyanja. Okay. Nyanja is not actually um, a language per se, but it's a combination of Eastern uh, languages. Nsenga, Ngoni, Tumbuka, so they come up with a Nyanja, which is a town in Ngoni. Now, we, uh, we skipped a little bit in the witch discography. We went from, uh, in the past, via Wings of Africa, the Muzio Tunia record, to the uh, Lukambo Vibes album, which is their fourth. But they had a third album called Lazy Bones, and it's a very special record. In it, um, in my opinion, you know, you guys hit the psychedelic rock zenith for, for Zamrock. Mm -hmm. Things changed after, yes, after yes. the release of Lazy yes. Bones. I just wanted to play a quick song from that, um, one of my favorites, like many. One, one of them, the, the, the title song, Lazy Bones, sold 3,000 copies, 7,000 copies in three weeks. It helped us redeem the loan we had from two record company. We, after we parted company with the, our two managers, we got a loan from two record company and we bought the equipment. We had sold two, two master tapes to Kuzuayo, and then we added something. So we, we had our own transport and our own equipment, which was 15,000 quarter, a set of um, equipment equivalent to 15, what is 15,000 quarter? It's about $1,500 that time. Yeah, something like that. It wasn't uh, 
No, uh, $3,000. This is a special yeah. album. Um, yeah, yes. Very special album. I also like uh, what I wrote on Motherless Child because this came to, to happen later. I don't know what your favorite is on that one. I, do say. Well, I, I actually like the entire album. I mean, Lazy Bones is a, is a bit of um, the obvious choice because okay, it's a single. Okay, play the should title we, song then. Should we play it? You want to hear Lazy Bones? Jaggery Chand on vocals from the Lazy Bones album. From the master tapes, this man had the wherewithal to preserve his master tapes since that record was released in 1975. What happened was uh, when pirates set in uh, in my country, uh, two record companies decided to go back to South Africa. And they were courteous enough to give back the master tapes to the Zambian musicians. So we took advantage. And I, I kept the master tapes because I was the only one alive at the time. So I kept the, which has actually resulted in what we are talking about today. Because if I had lost them, if I had lost that, uh, the master tapes, we w you wouldn't have got anything to, to refer to. I, I salvaged them and took them to South Africa to be transferred on the dots, actually. Was Lazy Bones a popular album when it came out? Yes, it's, it's sold most. Um, the what album, I, not just the seven inch, uh, the album? Uh, yes, um, I mean in terms of uh, space of time. When we, when we signed with two record company, the, the contract said an album per year. That was the idea, that we should release an album per year so that we could redeem the loan. So the band lived on live performances, in, uh, uh, earnings. All the, uh, the, the royalties went to two record company. And then fortunately, this was the first album that two record companies sponsored under the new contract. And within three weeks, it sold 7,000 copies. They were very happy with us. So they, they were quick to sponsor us now to go to back to, to, to Nairobi to go. And this was done in Lusaka. But we went back, we, we were sent now to um, Nairobi, where Mosotunya was that time. Now, yeah. In terms of rock being the uh, predominant music favored by a certain subset of the Zambian music buying population, were you aware of how singular that was in Africa? I mean, I think of all of the countries in Africa that you know I know of 70s music originating from, only Nigeria had a rock scene to speak of, and that was largely due to Ginger Baker and his arrival there. Whereas in Zambia, this landlocked country in, mm. in the southernmost part mm. of Africa, mm. 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 you're releasing this incredible rhythmic music at a time when what we now call yacht rock mm. was taken over the airways mm. in America and other parts of the world. Um, the, the, we didn't have so much influence from other people because there was um, independ independent struggles around uh, within our neighbors. So we didn't have, the, the migration was limited. We were not allowed to go to South Africa. We were not allowed to go to Angola. We were not allowed to go to Mozambique because of the, the war that was going prevailing for, for independence. So we depended on radio stations. There was, a, and some record shops like Piano House, which was in Kitwe. It was within uh, the proximity where we lived. And then uh, we had uh, a place in uh, Mozambique called Lorenzo Mar Marques. That's what I remember. This is Lorenzo Marques. And they would play top 10, top 20, top 50, just like uh, beat in Germany. We used to listen to such. And then we used to, to read Melod Maker. Then I would imagine, what, what would the, the singer for satisfaction what would he be doing? I started imagining, what would he be doing for him to interpret that no satisfaction? I can get no. So I was imagining myself sometimes, like if, if I was singing for the Rolling Stones, what would you do? So with the exception of OCB, so you weren't listening to any other African rock bands or black rock bands in general? Were you listening to Jimi Hendrix, for instance? Yes, well, yes. Every guitarist in my country who called themselves guitarists, they started by playing a hey Joe. <laughs> and that's how you would know whether they were serious with their uh, guitar and things. So besides the Rolling Stones and Jimi Hendrix and OCB, so who were some other influences? Deep Purple, Grand Funk Railroad, um, some, and some, some, the Hollies and things. They had, I liked their harmonies and things. 
And then we we had local musicians also, but uh, they didn't have albums. They, we, we just listened to the radio. Uh, Ptolemyo Walia, Isaac Mapipki, they were social commentators. They talked about what um, the uh, social evils in the country and many different interesting subjects. So they were very influential also in the way they played. Let me ask you about another musician who I mentioned earlier who mm -hmm. released his mm -hmm. debut album the mm -hmm. same year that Lazy Bones came out, Paul Ngozi. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about Paul Ngozi? Well, Paul Ngozi, um, in himself, he was a rocker. He was like us. But he, he never went to grade five, grade six in terms of education. So he was very limited in writing English songs. So they, they advised him that you just sing in local languages so that at least. He, and uh, he became influential because he could also play guitar with his teeth. And you know, in a place like that, that time, everybody said, ah, even Jim Hendrix does this and things and things. So, but basically, the music, he had maybe three, four chords repeated, but what he talked and sang along those <laughs> is what fascinated people. <laughs> well, l let's play one song from Paul Ngozi and the Ngozi family's debut album called Day of Judgment. This song is called Hi Baby and recorded and released in the same year as Lazy Bones to give you guys some context. <laughs> The attitude with which Paul Ngozi and his uh, th you know, three other bandmates mm. conveyed that message. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's only when they get to the bridge, they're talking about peace and, you know, this man next to you is your brother. But for the most part, he's talking about going to his tailor and meeting chicks on the street in the morning. If you guys could see the cover to this record, I wish I brought it with me. It's these, you know, these Zambian cats with capes and platform boots and dreadlocks. And you know the design is by a guy named Stoned Frog, and it's called Day of Judgment. And the title track is all about you know how the sinners are going to go to hell, and you know some Christians are going to go to paradise. It's an amazing <laughs> album, and that record, as raw as it was, was released in the same year that they released their third album. I mean, we're kind of splitting hairs here as we're going through a very short amount of time, but. This was a, a, a country in flux, and this was a music scene in which anything could go. And was Paul Ngozi successful with this first album? Yeah, that time, um, anything that was Zambian, by Zambians, musically, uh, people were just buying. Uh, the records were cheap. They were six, six, uh, thousand, six quarter. I think it was about 20 cents. <laughs> So at least, uh, unlike today where the CDs are $10, uh, that time they could afford. And usually it was the youngsters who had just joined the mines, the railways. They used to have free money. They were bachelors, most of them. And that's where we got most support. And we made sure we took our shows probably where the nurses were training because they, they served as an attraction to the men. So <laughs> if there was a nursing school somewhere and there was a big hall near there, that's where we took our concerts. So that at least people say, ah, there will be nurses there, maybe I can, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> In the same year, the man who we discussed when we were discussing Muzio Tunia, Ricky Ilalanga, mm -hmm. the lead guitarist from Muzio Tunia, mm -hmm. released his first album, which he called Zambia. Mm -hmm. Was there a, a certain amount of pride that just came in being Zambian after independence? Well, um, Ricky Lilonga and Keith Mlev were competing who was a better lead guitarist. And um, they actually pioneered the solo, solo scenario where the musicians wanted to, be, to release albums by themselves. There was Ricky Banda, Ricky Lilonga, Keith Mlev, and two or three other um, musicians of the time. When the bands broke, they didn't want to regroup. They went to do their own things, including Pongos. He was a guitarist for Mosetunia. Ricky Lilonga was a guitarist for Mosetunia. So, so the uh, Zambia album, which contains songs in not only English, but Bemba, mm. Nyanja, all and these and other and languages. Lozi. Yes. What, was, it, was this a popular record for Zambians? Did it give Zambians a sense of identity? Kumuzi kwa kamanda selelo baba dade. That one played a lot on radio. He said that uh, Ricky did say that it was yeah. the slow songs that always succeeded for him. Yeah, it did. I think it was good. 
good, good, good song. But in the Zamrock context, um, and this is kind of interesting, I, I wanted to get into a little bit of Ricky Lalonga and Keith Malevu, who both uh, recorded all of their own instruments in multi-track studios when that became available. Mm -hmm. And uh, within about a year of the release of, of Lazy Bones, Ricky's first solo album came out, and so did Keith Malevu's, right? When we were the first uh, to sign up with two record company, um, seriously, and then you see, they were they were very happy with the outcome, the results that they got from us. So a lot of other musicians went to Two Record Company also to do the same thing. Three or four bands were also uh, sponsored to Nairobi, and Rick Irilonga was one of them. There was another uh, promoter called Chris Furnitures. Um, he also promoted uh, Chris Mbewe's solo album, and the Strictly Pongos was under Chris Furniture. A furniture yes, store? Yes. Sold records? No, Produced uh, records? The, the, the proprietor was promoting music. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, let's play this one Ricky Lalonga song. Um, he had spoken earlier as to how uh, instrumental music wasn't popular, but this is not only instrumental, but it's, it's kind of out there. This is Hot Fingers from Ricky's first album, Zambia. Come on, baby. So, all right, that was Keith Malevu, Love and Freedom, and Ricky Lalonga with Hot Fingers. You mentioned that you know there was a song on the Zambia album that was a hit for Ricky, but I mean, was Keith popular or was this underground music? I mean, we're kind of delving a bit deeper down the rabbit hole here. I tell you what, I was in school when these guys were already established musicians, and they had bands. Keith Mlev used to play for a band called Rev Five, the Rev Five. They were the version of Earthquakes, where. Um, this vocalist from Mosetunia, uh, what's, what's Derek? Derek. Derek was the best player for a band called Earthquakes. They, became, they were first in Osaka Beatles, they became Earthquakes. And when they broke up, Derek went to form Mosetunia. When Rev 5, where Dr. Fuswich and them were, Keith went solo. So these are from two big um, bands that were, in fact, they had, they had started music way before I did, but they never recorded anything. They were just playing copyright music. We gave ourselves the task to say, in the morning during a one secret, we had two secrets maybe. When we rehearsed, we rehearsed from Tuesday to Thursday, or Monday to Thursday, from nine to one o'clock. One o'clock we broke, we, we broke for lunch, 14 to 17 hours. So in the morning, we were playing copyright. In the afternoon, we were composing our own music. And then we told ourselves, no girlfriend in the rehearsal room, for a simple reason. <laughs> the simple reason is that when someone says you're not singing right or you're not playing right, it's misunderstood that you're trying to embarrass them or they don't know, they're not good enough. But in rehearsals, that's where you correct things. If you don't sing, uh, uh, play right that particular time doesn't mean that you're not a good player. You can make a mistake there, even if you're a good player. That's why it's a rehearsal. But people misunderstood it. So we, we said, no girlfriend, no matter how new, how beautiful they are, you meet them after the, <laughs> the, the, the rehearsals. It helped. It helped us a lot. So was this popular music? I mean, were these people able to make a living selling records? Uh, for us, it was slightly different. I can speak on, on behalf of my band. Because we didn't get the royalties, we set, it took about uh, three to four years, three, two albums. No, the third album, that's when we were able to redeem the loan. So we had no royalties from two record company. We lived on the monies that we collected during live performances. But uh, poor tried, I think, because sometimes he took his uh, records in his car and went around. Wherever he performed, he sold records as well. You're talking about Paul and Gozi? Yes. I don't know about uh, Mosetunia and these others, because Mosetunia's album was re um, released by two record company, first one. I don't know the other sequel uh, records, but the first one was recorded by two, I think. I'm thinking that things must have got kind of desperate at a certain point because you said that Paul Ngozi was sponsored by Chris Furniture Company, which released records under the name Chris Editions. But mm. at a certain point, he started bootlegging his own records on his own label 
the same time that they were released on Chris Editions. So <laughs> things must have been kind of crazy because he, he didn't just do it once. He did it numerous times, different variation for a cover, slightly different mix of the record, but on his own label. Um, as much as we didn't have facilities, even managers didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> so I'm sorry to say, because them, uh, they, they, only Kuzuayo was an individual running a, a record company. These others, it was a by the way, they had other businesses and which they concentrated on more than they did on music promotion. So sometimes musicians just thought, oh, I can do this, I can sell my music. So they went and printed music, especially when we found out it was cheaper to go and print your own records in Nairobi and take them to Zambia. So some people went to Nairobi and printed their records and brought them to Zambia and they sold. And so that way they, they were not answerable to anybody. And the, the issue of contracts was new in that country. That's no wonder why the, the former manager we had said, you don't trust me, why do you want a contract? <laughs> it's that kind of thing. It's, uh, it's a pit, but uh, it worked for some time. It, was, it, it meant getting royalties twice a year. Whereas if you sold your own records right there and then you had cash in your pocket. You mentioned again uh, Edward Kuzayo. Mm. Kuzayo? Kuzuayo. Kuzuayo. He's, he's a Zimbabwean. He okay. was Zimbabwean. You mentioned him again. He, mm. he was the man with Zambia Music Parlor who released that Paul Ngozi record, the Ricky Lalonga record, and uh, of course, as we said earlier, mm. repressed the first two Witch albums. But he also uh, dealt with a band called The Five Revolutions, who would go on to be quite a big deal in the country. Um, he managed uh, a few other b uh, groups, the Tinkos. Uh, Five Revolution, Blackfoot, and John Mwansa, and a few other groups. Um, after, after he was he was like a, an agent for two record company until he signed a few other people on his own label. That's when Music Parlor became established as a parallel um, record company to two record. But two record company pressed records for Kuzwayo. You talked uh, in an interview that we did earlier uh, mm -hmm. this year about Kalindula. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit about what that is and how the five revolutions uh, mm -hmm. kind of transferred from Zamrock to this musical form? Yes, Kalindula is one form that, we, that is recognized in, in Zambia as uh, authentic music uh, from rural setup. Um, the central part of Zambia up to Luapula province near Congo, that is the kind of music they play. It's for sundown serenades that normally when they have, they have um, a social evening after harvest, after um, they succeed in doing some things, people brewed beer and they, they made music in the evenings, especially under the moonri uh, moonlight. So this is the type of music they call Kalindula. It's just one of the types of Zambian music. It's not the only Zambian music. I'd like and to play one, one Five Revolution song from the mid-70s. Okay. Because uh, it's a very interesting uh, you know, style. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, even know how to pronounce this. Chibele Bense? Chibele Bense. Okay, Chibele Bense by the Five yeah. Revolutions, also released on the Zambia Music Parlor imprint. Yes. Yeah. If, you, if there's a bit... Uh, of my song there, I'm not <laughs> Nazingwa, yeah, yeah. It was the the beat. This is slightly slowed down, but if you listen to most of the stuff, it's similar. Except this one is using a funeral song, it's saying I'm crying for my mother was in one town, Mazabuka, something, something. What hap something happened to her there? This is what he's talking about. You mentioned a, a melancholic feeling in the Nazingwa song, but mm. in a lot of the Zamrock songs in particular, I, mm. I find this overwhelming melancholic quality. Is there a reason? I mean, was it ha did it have anything to do with the economic conditions at the time, the struggles that you guys were going through, what you saw happening in neighboring countries? Actually, this, this came to light after I would studied music. That's when I could even describe the music that way. Before that, it didn't click to me that it would be melancholy or something. But I think the, the, the situation in, in, in a nation influences the artists. Take, for instance, uh, Jamaican music. It's a protest music most times. If you, if you um, South, South African, the, the apartheid period, um, it did something to them which they were not happy about. And 
the, that was expressed in their music to show that they were not happy with what was going in there, or going on in there. So I think it it has some influence. If in uh, your surrounding, your neighborhood, your country is going some in some kind of trouble or change or something, it spills over onto the the, the, the residents of the place, including the musicians themselves. There's one song I wanted to play by Paul Ngozi's drummer, Chrissy Zebi Tembo, mm. who was able to release his own music in the late 70s, at around the, the time that you released your last album, with which which was awkwardly titled With Janet, hit single. <laughs> but this song is Chrissy Zebi Tembo with the Ngozi family called Born Black, and I figured that it would be an appropriate uh, song to play following what he just said. What I learned from Pongozi's uh, bandsmate is that at one point he refused to share the money that he got from his own compositions. So he told them, I'll back you up, compose your own music, I'll, I'll help you record, and you can have your own money. So he allowed Chrissy Zeppi Tempo to record exactly. under those auspices. Exactly. So this song, did you guys understand what he was singing about in that song, Born Black? I am born black and I'm poor. You know, I'm now a laughing stock. Mm -hmm. He goes throughout, you know, like asking rather simple questions. When will I be happy? Why can't I live like other people? Um, was this, was this a, a common set of questions asked by, you know, your generation? Um, very few people understand the changes in the world now. Uh, which now uh, transcends um, across color. Now our generation is, thank God, they, they don't regard color. They regard what you are carrying in there. Um, th before that, there was a problem. Even today, I'm sorry to say it, I was the only one who was asked many questions at the airport. They came to me two, three times, and I could tell it was my color. Uh, well, have you been here? Uh, let's see your passport. They went away. Oh, wait here. And they went, came back. Okay, it's okay. I go to the next point. They fish me out. I'm police. Have you been here? That kind of thing. And <laughs> I know it, this thing would take some time to go away. But it's there. Whether we want it or we don't want it, it's there. We can't deny it. Um, that was worsened during the, uh, our time. Our time, there were very few people who would find employment and live on it. Either they were miners, laborers, or something. The, the blacks generally haven't excelled well in economic terms. Maybe this is the reason why. Why didn't Witch write, sing songs like Paul Ngozi and Chrissy Zeppi Tembo and the Ngozi family did? Well, <laughs> I don't know, but maybe... Uh, we, we regarded ourselves different, and then um, also, um, I'm not trying to boast, but I think I'm trying to uh, emphasize a point. Uh, at that time, we were thinking we were better musicians than Pongos at that time. So we couldn't uh, play music like Pongos. Oh, I'm uh, sorry, I didn't mean uh, the style of playing. I meant uh, in the social commentary, it seems oh, like... Oh, we have social... We have social uh, it's just that you, you haven't got uh, the, the black tooth, uh, tooth factory. Tooth factory, oh yeah, we, we don't. Have, um, we have a few songs like that. Can you name one that we could maybe play? Uh, maybe Motherless Child. Motherless Child, yeah. Let, tell, tell us a little bit about that song. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about it. Oh, first let it sing. So okay, <laughs> there it is. Oh, <laughs> let's see, hold on. I got it right here. Thank you. Motherless child from Lazy Bones, so now you can explain. Um, this is uh, an observation I, I made in the society. You know, when the, uh, the family bones were breaking, uh, we started having street kids. Before that, there were no street kids in, in Zambia because every child was a child of a society in which they lived. Maybe the, the aunties or the uncles would take over the responsibility of looking after the children when they lost if their, their parents, their uh, biological parents. And then unfortunately, there was this, uh, partly there's this uh, not enough money coming into the family. So uh, an extra mouth was a burden. So we are trying, 
this boy has no future uh, living. He's uh, uh, a motherless child. But let him hang on to dear life. You don't know what you have in future. This is what I'm trying to say. I'm encouraging the motherless children. But are they, if you say, oh, the boy was born, born in the world of crime and poverty, those, those were terrible things. There's crime. Crime is brought about because people don't have enough food. And they don't care if they're short or stealing because it's either they die starving or they are killed because uh, they have stolen from somebody. And they are bad eggs in society. And the, the kids that grow without parents, they are a time bomb. When at a certain time when they grow up, they will need to have their own families. And if they have no state income, no, no, no jobs, the result is disastrous. This is what I was trying to say in that song. You were limited in your means to record and to promote your music and to tour because the only tours that you did were basically in uh, the neighboring countries mm -hmm. when there wasn't conflict going on. Mm. Yet you were able to maintain a, a career in music for a good stretch and put out an incredible amount of, of albums in a small amount of time. Did you regard yourself as fortunate in that regard or did you look at all of these other artists whose music you heard on the radio or you read about in magazines and thought to yourself, why can't I be like that? Well, the first thing I can say personally, because I can't speak on behalf of uh, my other people. Personally, um, it started with fame, trying to be famous and to be independent financially. Um, if, in fact, I didn't choose to become a musician. Somebody just forced me and said, we've seen you perform during social evenings at school. You can join a band. Actually, they were, and then I jammed with four, three, five bands, local bands. And they said, why don't you just join a band? And I had one year to go to finish high school. So I would jam. Then one time, this, this manager of the other band, two of the bandsmen there were my classmates. The band was called Black Souls. So two of them were my classmates. And then the, the manager of uh, the forerunner to the witch was uh, Christopher Kalova. He, he owned the band called Kingston Market. The drummer there at one time, he kept waiting for me at quarter at one in the afternoon when I knocked off from school. My manager wants to see you. Oh, wow. Because we used to keep song books in, in, in class for the equals and things, sometimes wrong words, but we could sing Babijo. And um, there was a, an in Indian teacher whom we teased with that. We were st when he came, we were saying Wawijo, we wa Wawijo, because their V is W. And we would sing Wawijo, we wa Wawijo, we wa, <laughs> and then things like that. Then I would perform when the teacher is not there. And during social evening, they say, but your style, you can, you can do it. And that's how I was discovered. And I then one time he came, waited for me, and gave me 16 kwacha. That was a lot of money for a schoolboy. I bought a pair of shoes, and I bought the whole class sweets and uh, drinks, and that's how I got influenced. So, was, so was when you say you wanted to become famous then, you only wanted to become famous in Zambia, or did you want uh, a bigger presence? Did you want to go to different parts of Africa? Did you want to travel and perform throughout the world? What were your aspirations during your time oh. with which? I wanted to be famous like the Beatles, because the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, well, those are the bands we listen to. Even in radio, and I said, ah, everywhere you, you go, in, there are Beatles songs playing. So I want to be like that afterwards. Before, it didn't click to me that the fame would go with money. Because we, we didn't have magazines like you people have, someone driving Rolls Royce. I just didn't want to be, I wanted to be financially independent and famous. But after some times, I was uncomfortable with the fame. I couldn't hide to do my private things. Everybody was looking, so <laughs> I didn't like that aspect. The last album that you did with The Witch, uh, as we mentioned earlier, with Janet, uh, hit single, mm. was that the biggest album that the band released? No, the band, almost everything by The Witch sold. In, in Zambia, uh, I just uh, I remember the there's a time I found a small magazine from South Africa and we had the song called Sweet Sixteen, 
a group from Malawi had played it, the female group, and it was a single, but we had no means to go and pursue that case in South Africa. The, but everything that uh, the witch did soared highly in, in Zambia. Can we play one song from this, your last album with the band? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I was looking I'll at songs to play. Okay. <laughs> the Way I Feel, how about that one? Oh, yes, yes, yes. The Way I Feel from uh, the final album that Jaggery did with Witch. This, uh, this was um, written by my drummer, Boyd. The Way I Feel. That's a marvelous sounding record. Marvelous <laughs> sounding record. Like I told you, um, we worked hard to improve from, if you listen to introduction to this level, there's some change in quality of music that we were doing. And the quality of recording. Yes. This was done in, at Supra, Supra Studios in Nairobi. But within five short years, because that record was released in 1977, we went from the very garage sound of introduction mm. to mm. that very polished sound. Well, I should mention also there's a, a, a sixth guy that came in the background uh, that contributed also to writing of music. So his contribution also uh, helped improve the music of the band. What was his name? Shadik, Walia Shadik. But uh, later, after I left, they did two more albums which were disco oriented, but they were, they were not bad. You said disco oriented. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because that was now the in thing. So, that kind of thing, that's where they, they moved to. But that was done in Zimbabwe. We had gone to Zimbabwe, apparently, we were playing Bluwayo, and then somebody said, would you like to come and be a backup uh, band? Um, Bob Marley is coming to grace the occasion for the independence of Zimbabwe. And then unfortunately, our van broke down twice. We were unable to reach Harare before that time. We were only able to participate in the festival that followed thereafter. We didn't uh, attend Bob Marley's show, but he had come for Zimbabwe's independence. So while there, we had a contract there, and we recorded about one album and a single, which was they had just uh, won their independence, and we did a, a Shona song. It's, uh, this country we have got it is now Zimbabwe. And that was the first single by the witch which sold in Zimbabwe before the album uh, Moving On. Moving On was uh, when I left, Shadik and the group said, uh, we can still go on, even if he leaves, and which they did. So they did Moving On and Kuomboka before the band split. That marked, in a lot of ways, the death of Zamrock. Um, there weren't many bands from the early days remaining. Paul Ngozi and the Ngozi family continued releasing what I would consider Zamrock through the early 80s before changing markedly. But... Um, Derek Mbao was doing uh, kind of like a jazz fusion thing. Ricky had moved on and was doing reggae. There were two major issues that uh, confused the Zamrock era. Um, the curfew and blackout I talked about. It meant few bands played and earned enough money to, to live on. Because most of the, the bands there were full-time musicians. Um, so they were unable to play uh, in the night where they could uh, generate some funds. They had to do other things other than just play music. And also Congolese music, rumba, set in together with disco. Uh, it, it was easier for a DJ to play different bands in his uh, disco house than to listen to one band. And then uh, the disco music was continuous, no short break. So the people wanted to just go and dance their heads off and things. I think, personally, that's, those are the two things that uh, contributed to band splitting. Mm. Yeah. Looking back at that short period in which you and a bunch of groups, many of whom you inspired, created this music that we're now digging out, mm. uh, do you think that it was uh, sincere? I mean, were you 
just emulating or at a certain point had you just hit upon something unique and original? Are, I mean, are the Zamrock musicians that are left today, are they proud of what they created? I would say yes. Um, I, I, again, I want to say it on my own. I would say I'm proud, but I'm not satisfied. Because there's always a, a room for improvement for, for anything that you pursue. Uh, the Zamrock would have found its direction, proper direction eventually. Because those were just trying to fuse something we got from somewhere. But eventually we were going to follow our heart and play something that really came from our heart. Uh, music, when you play from your heart, um, there are thousands of music, musicians who are asked, which is your favorite song? It's very rare that a composer will have a favorite song. Because all the songs are created, all pieces of music are created by you. There's an effort, there's a feeling to that, there's a lot of things put in there for that song or piece of music to come out. It's, but there are certain things that you really feel, for instance, um, uh, if you ask me that question, there's a song, I had a dream, I had a dream four years before it really happened. It's like a prophetic thing, a strange dream. I dreamed my girlfriend had drowned. And then, for sure, after, after about two or three years, she died, on the pontoon capsized, and she died. So the, 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 the song actually was almost real. That's it's about as sincere as you can get. Yeah. Sometimes, if, if anything, if you're a copycat, you won't go far. But immediately, you, you know, the way we look different, we have a lot of different things inside us, bottled inside us, which if given an opportunity, we can bring out and a lot of other people will appreciate. The, the, the obstacle is financial independence. You know, if, if someone has, is willing to push and make someone work with guidance, not only just providing... You need, a, you need to separate a producer from a manager who's a sales manager and the studio producer who's keen with the, with the ear to tell you those are wrong chords for what you're seeing. That guitar string is not in tune. You need that. You need someone to tell you what is your target group for the music you are playing. Where can we sell this music? You need someone to tell you you can't sing. This song, give it to somebody else. It's your song, yes. But for the sake of selling it, for marketing, let's give it to this person. He will, he will do a better job of it. We need such people to, to separate the roles that, that uh, come together to make this music industry. It's not only writing a song or singing a song. There's a lot more to it than just that. So sometimes we have things we can't bring out because of situations and circumstances. So we are limited. And if you ask my friends here, fellow artists here, they will tell you, in Europe, if, if you listen, if you look at the TV and their adverts, they are very different from the adverts in, in Africa. You know, here, people, they have open-minded, okay? And the, the people with money will buy their ideas. Cartoons, if you look at the themes of cartoons, if you look at the, the buildings here, most of them would have been shot down in, Af in Africa. You can't bring this, what kind of, what is this? But here people want to say, are you sure you can do this? Okay, prove to us. If you can prove to them, they'll fund it. It's the same with music. If you have someone who believes in you, and, and you can prove, because it needs a lot of hard work. It's not just looking at people going and you write a song. It's, you must compose a song, let other people listen to it, let them give you their opinion. It's, it's only an opinion after all. In the end, you're going to do what you believe in. But they can give you an idea and say, ah, I think it's not sounding, sounding right. The bass line is not fitting this. You need such people. It's, it's a lot of people working together to produce one good music. Throughout the 80s, as you saw your peers, uh, many of them die in their 30s to their late 40s. Did you um, feel that there was a certain injustice in that? Like uh, these young men who had recorded and released this wonderful music, who no longer could release music in the way that they had because of piracy and the other 
uh, reasons that we d discussed earlier? I think the question of justice doesn't, uh, doesn't come in here. God's law is straight. You do this, you die. You don't do this, you don't die. There are few who are, who are lucky or blessed to live on, but there are very few. If, if you steal, they will arrest you. If you are careless with your life, you get sick. It's as simple as that. And uh, uh, there wasn't enough information. At the, you know, music is a risk business in terms of uh, sexual immorality. And uh, where we work, that's when people let their hair down, unfortunately. Um, that is our place. So that's our office. You are performing. But look at the people who wish they were you. There are so many. Who, you are making so many people happy. And you don't know what they are carrying. So if, if, if you don't check yourself, you don't check your life. I'm not saying I'm clever. I'm not saying I'm clever. That's why I'm alive. No. God is just merciful. He has spared my life. I think he has something bigger for me to do in life before I die. It's not that my friends were careless, were reckless, but that's what took most of the people. And then to make matters worse, they were shy to go and, and find, they were living in self-denial. And then also they didn't have means to go, they didn't have much money to go to um, good hospitals and see proper doctors who tell them what to do um, to sustain the condition in which they were. Because having a virus doesn't mean you're dying right now, right there and then. Uh, many things contributed. But looking at the number of people that died, by now we would have been making different music. We would have matured musically. But unfortunately, it was not to be. So there is a sadness. There is. Because it's mission and accomplished musically in the country. Uh, there's a big gap uh, a generational gap musically in the country right now. A lot of people come to me and say, you mean you can just give up music like that? And what about we, your friends who are missing your music? And I tell them, I can't sweep your house before my, I sweep mine. Unfortunately, um, too much risk in, in the worldly music in my country. Uh, before we open up to questions, so just because you had spoken about it, the song Strange Dream, to me, uh, was one of the first songs that I heard in the Zamrock form, mm. which really spoke with a spiritual quality. And, and I don't mean that in, in, a, in a crass sort of way. Mm. I just mean there was something more than what the words were saying, mm. and I couldn't figure it out. And you explained a little bit of it in mm -hmm. the premonition that, that led to the song. This is as, it, it's closer to my heart, together with the blood donor. Blood donor has got hidden meaning, which... Maybe I can share with the artists here because they are artists. When you compose as an artist, there are two meanings. There's the idiomatic meaning um, and uh, as per the idiom of the language. There's the literal meaning also. When you, when you write lyrics, hide some meaning inside there and so that people, it's like abstract art. You can make a lot of pictures out of a certain painting. This is the same thing. I wrote a song called Blood Donor. And it looked normal to people because people donate blood. But that's not what I meant. I talked about injections. I talked about being their doctor and things. That's not what I'm talking about. It's something else under there. Well, you listen to it in your time. <laughs> but please. Let's play Strange Dream. <laughs> A round of applause for Manuel Jaggery Chanda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I know that we don't have that much time because buses are coming relatively quickly, but uh, we can open up to questions if there are any. Oh, there we go. We need a microphone. Hi. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say you guys are, like, so much cooler than the Beatles. Like, <laughs> um, But really my question was just, um, like, the output of the band, like how quickly did you guys record or like a song? Would it take a day, a few hours? Like um, how was the recording process? I guess more so in the beginning when you guys started with the introduction. No recording took more than two days. For one track or for the um, album? There was nothing like if one makes a mistake, you just leave them to correct it. You had to start the whole song afresh. It was like live performance. 
Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a mono recording studio owned by one of the mining companies for their documentaries and things, but we forced our music into that. <laughs> <laughs> so you mean to say an album was recorded in two days? Exactly. Maximum. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, I wanted to ask if you're working on something new right now. And yeah, if yes, what? Um, yes, um, but I want to, to, to sing for the Lord now. Um, uh, uh, there's this gap for two reasons. Um, sometimes you talk to people, your dream, and uh, they think you're just joking. So I, I, I went into gemstone mining. I'm, I'm doing gemstone mining for now so that I can raise some funds and establish my own studio and school of music. Uh, that is my dream. You know it. So when you find me running, don't be surprised. Um, but with the Christian music, you cannot afford to misinterpret the Bible. So it's not as simple as just seeing people there and you write. You imagine they're in love and you write a song. Uh, the simplest theme for music is falling in and out of love. Anyone can write a song about that because that happens to everybody. But to, to talk about other things in life, you need time and a, a good thought over, over the matter. I have some music uh, that I've written already, but uh, I don't want to go and record in a studio which will be lower than what I did with the band. I will prove nothing by doing that. Um, you mentioned the importance of radio and how that united transnational African rock music. Were you able to establish um, a strong network between other, maybe more marginalized uh, music scenes like Ghana funk or, or psychedelic rock in Egypt? Um, you mean at, at that time? Yeah, at the time. The facilities were very, very limited. And we never knew, we knew very little about other bands outside uh, other than the ones we listened to on the radio. And uh, the, the records we could buy from, but when we signed a contract with T Record Company, they were distributing um, mu musics from ab abroad. So under the contract, they were given every latest album that was released in Europe or America, we had a copy. So before we played our own music, we wanted to excite people by maybe playing We Are An American Band, by changing it to We Are A Zambian Band. But the same, the rest is the same. Come on, dudes, let's get on. <laughs> and people liked it because um, one of the things that carried my band was my antics on stage. That's what earned me my name. They were calling me Jaga, and I didn't like that. So I Zambianized it to, first of all, they were calling me Jaga. So I put Y to it, it became Jagari. And I looked it up in the dictionary, it said dark brown sugar, which fitted my description. <laughs> but, then <laughs> but then later, in Nigeria, about the same time, there was a, a leader called Shaori Shagari. And I looked at the spelling, I said, oh, I can have an Africanize this name. That's when I Africanized it to J-A-G-A-R-I, Jagari. And it's the only name in Zambia. Although two of my fans have named their children after me. So you had no knowledge of other music that was going on in different parts of Africa. Ricky had told me that Fela was a big deal in Zambia at the time. Yeah, but... It wasn't, this was, um, uh, Fera came about in the 80s. We started playing during trade fair when we were hard. We used, and when we wanted to rest, when the, we play, say, lay down, stay down, is very taxing song uh, in terms of movements and things and things, very taxing, laid down by Deep Purple. We used to play that. Now, instead of us playing another fast song, probably we would bring in Fela Ramson Kut, pam pa ram pa ram pam pa and you, the band would rest somehow. <laughs> so some of the famous musicians you, you did hear through the radio, was Fela played on the radio? By the time we knew about Fela, the records had already started coming to Zambia. It was much later, but uh, if we talk about the early 70s to about late 70s to early 80s, 
those names were not there. So that would mean the marginalized acts that he's talking about didn't make it at all? I would say yes. They, they did not make it, or uh, they did? To, to influence us, that yeah. side. Yeah, did. What, was, there, was there a working knowledge? For, for, yes, but you know, you, you know, even if you listen to that music and performed in public, you would not record that kind of music, because even if we did no copyright, we, we knew that this is somebody's song. We would rather compose our own music. It influenced us in terms of the actual performance because when you can't just go and perform all your songs without mixing our our shows um, in Africa, probably in, in in my country particularly, they are very unfortunate shows by the bands. When you are hired to perform, it's not like here you have a concert of two hours. Me, I can play four concerts in two days if it's that easy. Two hours. Uh, but there, you start at 19.30, 7.30 in the evening, to about 2 a.m. with breaks in, in there. That's kind of, uh, it's very tiring kind of arrangement. So in, before you reach the climax of the show, you play instrumentals, then you play other people's music that would punctuate your, your, your speed of music. And then when you... W and, and again, we don't have sold out shows like you. Oh, you're going to a show you know already the people are coming and they have tickets. Our, our situation is different. People come in as you play. They, maybe they'll go to three or four different places, then they come to that show. It's a different scenario altogether. So you need uh, as much music from other people as possible before you can showcase what you have, uh, uh, what you, you would call your own. So that it's a different situation here. If there was an opportunity, my band would have made a lot of money. It was a good band. It was a talented band. People were working hard, despite our shortcomings in terms of uh, music knowledge and of, uh, other things. I have another question, if I may. Um, maybe you can talk a bit about uh, the sentiment uh, that you. Your, your circle of, of musicians had between finding a balance um, regarding resistance against cultural and political uh, imperial, imperialism and uh, still borrowing from uh, you know British art, uh, British artistic expression. Um, the musicians there in my country didn't look at it the way you are defining it so nicely. Them, the uh, music is just as it comes. If you if you upset me, I sing about you upsetting me, and that is it for for now. Oh, the only people who had uh, defined roles of music are the village people, the authentic musicians in a village setup. Yes, those had they had political songs, they had um, uh, some misgivings they noticed in the in the management of social life by the investors and things and things. But there were also some songs that our traditional composers, they were complaining about witchcraft, for instance, is saying, why why are you practicing so much witchcraft? There was a certain area in Zambia which was famous for. I did a song f from somebody's version, and uh, it's, it said, Kwa Mununga, Mununga is a place. Kwa means, the there in Monunga, witchcraft is like they just sell, and uh, you know, and uh, in the end, they lose lives that are important to society. Imagine you, you bewitch somebody who's supposed to be the next president. What do you gain? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. But uh, it's, it's one of the songs from earlier musicians. They didn't record, but very nice. Let me play it for you. A bit, maybe. This is my version, eh? This one is complaining about how they use <laughs> is describing what they use to make witch witchcraft, what to make the, the concoction to be with somebody. The the bird, a certain type of bird and the soil from the graveyard and things and things like say, Why do you use such things to kill other people? You know, this is the kind of thing it's but just to, not to just immediately return to what he was asking, but 
are you saying that you just heard the music that was being played in the airwaves that was being talked about in the magazines? You saw these guys, the way that they dressed, and you took it for what it was? You just you liked it? It didn't matter whether they were white Englishmen, white Americans, if they wore bell-bottom trousers or platform boots or skinny leg pants and desert boots. It didn't matter. It was just what you liked? Is that what you're saying? Look at the guys now. Look at, look at the mic. Look, look at the new guys now. Where are their trousers belts? <laughs> yeah, they are below the buttocks. Yeah. This is the fashion. The fashion that is there. No one tells them do this. Do fashion just it's a fad. It just comes and it influences. But I remember one time we went to play in Malawi, and uh, the president at that time, comes Banda, didn't allow people to have hair below their uh, earlobes. And they didn't allow any bell bottom over 14 inches. So we were forced to, <laughs> we were forced to, to wear socks and uh, bermudas like basic throwers, such things. And, uh, and people just had a picture. I'll show you the kind of clothes we wore. Some, the, some shoes you can't run in them that we had, we had made, we had them made in Nairobi. You wait for them, they are making the, the heels like this. And we called them Ankada. <laughs> so they were actually quite uncomfortable, but they looked, yeah, if you look at the Lazy Bones album, yeah. the, the shoes we are wearing there, they are homemade, but fashionable, but uncomfortable to a certain point. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, the, the, I know you can't imagine what I'm talking about, that side. I, I saw a lot of uh, traditional big guys who were playing for the radio station, like the song I just played now. They were very good musicians, but they were just used for political rallies. When the politicians came there to address meetings, they made them sing, play music in praise of the politicians. <coughs> then when people gathered, the politicians addressed people. They were used as a form of uh, attraction. It's only last week, uh, on 24th was our independence day, and there's a new president in my country. Um, he, wa he was in the opposition for 10 years, now he's the one in the saddle. And uh, one musician, a young musician, was, uh, had composed a song. He braved the intimidation of the former president and sang a song, Don't Tell Them. Because there's a tendency in, uh, in my country, when the elections are nearby, people dish out money, uh, clothes, things, they dish out so that they can be voted into power. Now he composed the song to say, don't kubeba, meaning don't tell them. And this is what the opposition used. It had so much influence and uh, uh, power. And then the opposition won. So he was honored last week for being uh, so brave and having son. He was honored by the president, which is a welcome thing. If they can be recognized, they'll be encouraged to do more. But uh, the the the... The themes for the songs, for the music, are endless. You can twist a, a topic of any situation the way you want. You know about the, the, the lyrics being rhyming and not losing the meaning and things. Those are quite, they, they make the song interesting as opposed to the letter you are writing to somebody. You are free to, to treat subjects the way you want. That is... A, a license given to every artist, every musician. You are free to treat this. I wrote a song called uh, Blood Donor. Let me just explain it to link up to what he's saying. I'm saying I'm living in a sick city. Those are the lyrics. I'm living in a sick city, and it looks I'm the only doctor. But only one injection, what a pity. You see, city and pity rhyme. And nobody will think anything else, but he's saying, yes, a doctor uses an injection when somebody's donating blood. And when I'm killing them softly, no doubt they all enjoy it. But only one injection, what a pity. <laughs> and towards the end, I'm, seeing, I'm saying, you seem to be my last patient. Sticking around is my promise until we get to paradise. Um, I'll be your blood donor. Forever your blood donor. I've got four patients every week, that's the chorus. And I'm feeling sick and tired. I really need someone to help me out. But you know what that is? That is not blood donation. You don't donate blood every week. 
You will have no blood in the body. Yeah, I'm just saying, I'm just one man with one manhood machine. Why do you, all of you want me to satisfy you sexually? That's what I'm saying. I'm complaining. <laughs> so, so, you know, you can hide the meaning in there and people say, yeah, actually, let's use his song f to encourage people to donate blood. <laughs> That's about as far away from the question that you asked as possible, but I, I mean, it was a hell of a story. I'm, I moved from your question because I'm trying to share some things. You know, we have this tendency as human beings. You can have a pretty girlfriend, you love each other, you understand each other, but you're waiting for someone to say, hey, your girlfriend is beautiful. That's when you realize, oh, I may, I may lose something nice. We have that tendency. We don't believe in ourselves to say, I've made a choice. This is good enough for me. Musically, it's the same. You think that the other person is a better musician than yourself. You have to believe in yourself. You have to believe that one day you are going to be the best. There are, two, there are never two, two best. Like every family, there's only one star. We don't have two, three stars in the family. Even if they are Michael Jacksons, they will only be one star. <laughs> Any other questions, or should we wrap it up? All right. I think we're good. You want to you do one more song on the way out? Tell me to play one song. One more song. <laughs> Manuel Jaggery Chanda, thank you. All the way from the Republic of Zambia. Wow.